And up next, we have Abu Mosa talking about scalability uh, with Snowflake. Um, I don't know if there is. I've got your slides here. Thank you. How's the day so far? You want to go home? Please stay with me another 30 minutes and then go home. Um, so let me see. Um, I'm from the University of Missouri. Uh, we want to talk about some operationalization stuff related to I2B2. You might like some of those things and appreciate. Uh, if you're interested in talking about any of the aspect, uh, I'll be here until tomorrow. Um, primarily talking in terms of scalability of the application. Now there are different approaches uh, being tried, but uh, we're gonna show our, uh, tell you our story. Um, no financial uh, disclosures, um, but I'm a board member of I2B2. So I think I have the right to sell I2B2 anywhere. <laughs> Please use I2B2. Uh, some of the content in my slides are directly coming from the, the PicorNet. We are part of the PicorNet network. Uh, so we talk about PicorNet a little bit as well. Uh, we're gonna start with a demonstration running a query on 32 million patients, 1.3 billion encounters and 25 billion clinical observations from the GPC network. And the approach we did to, to make it happen, um, that means making it functional for our situation. Okay, how do I go to the desktop? Sharing only. Um, the, share the browser? Yeah, can I share the browser or? Or I'll escape for the sake of the time then. Well, you are familiar with I2B2, so I would just tell you that trust my slides, okay? Um, but I could give you a little bit of flavor how the system looks like in terms of running, which is no different than running your standard I2B2. So I have the snapshot from the slide as well. Um, so when I run this query, this one is a type 2 diabetes adult and running hemoglobin A1C. So at least involving one demographic and two uh, other domain of data. Uh, could do all the analysis, the breakdowns like top 20 medications, top 20 um, diagnosis, age, gender, and all of the breakdowns, but also breakdowns of the sites that data is being represented in the system. So created one additional plugin to support that and runs pretty reasonable amount of time. That when I took the snapshot, it was 465 seconds, but then I ran one today. Um, less than 300 seconds. Um, and you, you have seen a lot of great um, uh, first-hand analysis can be done using I2B2. You have seen throughout the, the day. And if you can run those things within a reasonable amount of time, it's great because you can start uh, browsing data and uh, like a shopping cart and start exploring uh, in, a, in a quicker manner. So in this presentation, we're gonna talk about multi-institutional self-service query capability. I2B2, uh, running I2B2 on the PicorNet common data model because that's our network and that we participate in. Serverless I2B2 and relevant security uh, management, uh, uh, which is NIST 853 in our situation. Um, and also running I2B2 on Snowflake that helps us scale in a much easier way. So why the motivation related to self-service query? I don't think in this community, I have to justify that I2B2 is a great tool for facilitating uh, self-service query um, by drag and drop query building. Um, 
And if you look into a network operations, how many queries you can facilitate in a self-service versus going through a set of administrative procedure that submitting a request, building core analytical queries and, and dispatching those to each individual sites and wait for the result to come back. But before you can dispatch, you, can ha you have to quality assure those pack query packages. Involving all of those, it is a, it, 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 it makes it very expensive, not only in terms of the time it takes, but also, um, uh, also you have to budget for the people. So anything that you want to uh, look into data in a first hand, like drag and drop quality building, I to be to does great facilitation internally, but then if we can also bring data from multiple sites, it's more powerful. Um, this one is a dashboard from Picorner showing that um, there's a demand for this kind of activities, but then when you have a process does not um, democratize the fact of people can use their own time to interact with the data, you can't uh, scale to volume to serve more people. And uh, that's the motivation that, um, that we, we need, need more of this kind of uh, processes and application in place. In terms of PicorNet, uh, it's a network of networks, if you don't know what it is, and the diagram pretty much looks like the NAC network that shows all the dots actually overlaps pretty well. Um, but it's a PicorNet network funded by Picori. There are eight networks and you see the institutions uh, that participates in different networks. And you, you go to the PicorNet website, you, you can see that. Um, that facilitates access to over 66 million people in the network um, and that is, uh, ac ac across the country. And there's a front door, Picorne front door, you can go through to request data, run queries and do different things. Then within the network, our network is the Greater Plains Collaborative Network. Um, and you can see in the diagram where we present high volume of data um, in the country. And we have a front porch as well, so that people can do the, the same process to request data and access data too. One of the thing is for cohort discovery to anything that lightweight query execution for self-service query, it becomes a little bit of barrier in terms of to know the population, uh, what exists in the data. And I2B2, what I'm saying, can be a great tool to, to facilitate those self-service query mechanism. So I already talked about it, like I2B to enable self-service queries and being able to query data nationwide at your fingertip is powerful for clinical research. That's the, the bottom line that I was trying to tell you. Uh, but how can we activate that? So one of the approach that I was taking that minimum efforts from the side, what kind of technology can be enabled that people are building PicorNet common data model that is already in place. Can I have a wrapper around it to so that I to B2 can query the data, but can also data be visible to the application, um, but the sites do not have to do anything beyond sharing the data. Now we could do a single centralized enclave model, but we did a little bit of different uh, approach in, in, in this, uh, dem uh, in this uh, demonstration. Uh, in our multi-institutional data lake, uh, we already talked about the numbers um, as part of the demonstration that I did not give to you. Um, but that's the population and the size of observations that we have uh, in our uh, among our 13 institution. And we are also looking forward to deploy this similar capability um, nationwide. So we are doing a pilot with, with the PicorNet Coordinating Center, which is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And um, yeah, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is the coordinating center for query fulfillment core. And we are partnering with them to, to, to brought in Vanguard size to demonstrate that uh, data sharing and activation of I2B2 uh, is being made possible. And we already did one further step uh, towards that in terms of revising data sharing agreement, how it may look like, and then also bringing uh, data from another institutions into the platform um, to, to demonstrate that. Uh, it's probably far away to go, but uh, showing the pathway I think is, is helpful so that, um, that the partners uh, understand what might be feasible. Um, 
in terms of the demonstration, I was going to show you that the typical login screen and then the in common activation. So the login is through the in common federation that goes through the institutional shibboleth login. Um, that's how we set it up so that for every institution's participating, they can participate through the in common so that um, credential management uh, belongs to each individual institution's single sign on capability. And if you want to talk, uh, with me, how we did that, our team could help um, uh, regarding that question. But thanks for the SAML authentication uh, implementation. I believe, is it the Pittsburgh team did the SAML implementation? Yeah, so great, thank you. So that was really, really helpful for us to, uh, to, to implement that. Um, so then selection of the data mart, right? Um, we have the GPC data leg there. And then you land into the, the typical, um, our, our traditional I2B to query interface. We also implemented the new query interface, but we did not roll it out fully because our front facing um, the staff is still looking into that interface and then they're gonna train the users to, to, to use that. But personally, I like it better. So uh, please try it. I2B2 on Picornet common data model. So that's the Picornet common data model. If you're familiar with OMOP, um, OMOP has similar set of tables just organized in a different way. Um, then we could do the mapping of those tables to the I2B2 multi-fact views. So um, I say, I'm saying views, we truly implemented views and it, it works, um, believe me. Um, but it can be created as a transformation into a physical table as well using the same script. So we created the script um, that can be obtained from our University of Missouri GitHub repository uh, and the repository is public. So you can you can obtain that uh, from there if you have a current common data model. But if you're doing OMOP, there is another repo for the, the OMOP to I2B to harmonization as well. Uh, which we did not do, right? They, it exists in the I2B2 world. And I forgot who did the lead on that, but I believe Jeff was talking about it. Um, so the way the harmonization works is harmonization is created as secure views in Snowflake. Um, that's the implementation right now. And it uses a physical table for crosswalk management. So the data is not being the personal level records are not being uh, do, uh, recreated in in the I2B2 harmonization. Instead, it was kept as a views uh, for querying pers a perspective. In, in our practice, we try to reduce uh, data replication as much as possible. This reduction does help us uh, data not floating around, but also uh, cost optimization perspective as well. Uh, performance can be an issue, but it has not been an issue so far for us um, in terms of query execution. The serverless I2B2, uh, how we did that? Well, now I'm saying serverless doesn't mean that there is no server in it. What I meant, there is no physical server and it was done in a, a, a deployed as a Docker container. That's what I meant. So don't take it uh, in, a, uh, in another way. Um, we have a cloud activation for our data lake operations um, and the entire cloud was uh, assessed and being revised um, bi-weekly, but also every year audited for the NIST 853 compliance. Um, our I2B to one Docker for the, uh, the web server, one Docker for the JBoss, and in the backend, it is Snowflake. Before Snowflake, we had the AWS database migration service, uh, which is the uh, was the MySQL server, sorry, PostgreSQL server. And for the Snowflake deployment, uh, we had to do the development of the supporting of the Snowflake, and we deposited the source code in the I2B2 repository. There's a Snowflake branch, uh, if you are interested uh, to try it out. Um, so the there's the Elastic Container Service, but then it is also have the auto scaling uh, deployment using the AWS Fargate, and there is the connectivity to Snowflake. Um, I would not go into the very much details of it. But before that, our architecture looked a little different. We had the 
AWS database migration service in terms of cost, I'll say it was not very much effective for us, but performance was a big issue. And we had to do quite a bit of data movement from Snow, because our data lake operation is in Snowflake. And for I2B2, it was in the PostgreSQL. So we had to you know, migrate the data in the PostgreSQL. So it was taking extra time to manage that pipeline. Uh, so instead of uh, working on the automation of that pipeline, we invested our energy to see, we took the risk to see if we can activate Snowflake behind I2B2. And I think that was a great advantage for us to activate one more database platform to support uh, I2B2 uh, to, to run on. Um, so what is the workflow looks like in, in your uh, containerized deployment? Um, the, you, you build the Docker images, right? Upload the Docker images. We upload in the AWS, uh, elastic container registry. And then, uh, and then we created the elastic container service task, uh, to launch the cluster. And then you can just think about like a Trojan, right? Pushing the Docker to run on the cluster. So hot swap is pretty easy for us. Whenever we have to upgrade something or redeploy it, uh, we try on a dev Docker. Once the Docker is ready, we push the Docker because we don't have to restart the entire server. Just hot swap the the Docker, the 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 container in the Elastic Container Registry, and then initiate the task to pull the container into the cluster. The server is updated. We don't have to worry about the security setup, network routing, or everything because everything remains same. So it's like changing one component in the entire environment. That made the deployment much easier. Our engineers love it. So comparing to our old old setup, we also made um, this workflow um, available as a public repository. Now, thank you to the people who showed that containerization of I two B two is feasible. And that was not that I invented, but there is a publication about it. Um, but then we we know that it it is being possible, even though I2B2 is a pretty heavy application. Containerized deployment is feasible. And with AWS activation of the of the compute node as a cluster beside the container deployment made it much easier to manage the environment um, because they are not tied to each other. <laughs> So I already talked about the workflow. Um, the, the GitHub repository does give you a script um, that you can to, uh, that you can use from updating your Docker definition in GitHub, but then you run the script that will take it from GitHub, push it to the Elastic Content Registry, and then initiate the uh, ECS task. And the task could deploy. Well, uh, the cluster is being deployed, but then do the rest of the compilation process to create the the Docker and activate the Docker in the in the environment. So it, it's pretty much uh, semi automated. You have to push few buttons once you create this pipeline. Uh, makes it much easier to manage. So we talked about it. In terms of our cl compute cluster, we put a very, well, we did experimentation with higher amount of compute power, but however, because it is a low throughput application, that means we don't expect hundreds of people sitting in I2B to computing every time. How, but if someone is running a query, they might build a very complex query that might take longer time to execute on the database end. That's what we focused on. So here we have four virtual CPU and 16 gigabyte of RAM. Even if I increase any of those resources, it doesn't help performance wise because the compute resides on the database server. So that's why you need to do the tuning and optimization. And that's why I think most institution is spend time on tuning and optimization based on the database uh, application that you select for. Um, that's our monthly cost in the AWS to run all the Dockers and everything. That's the AWS cost only. That's not the Snowflake cost, just as an FYI. Um, so if you wanna look into at a glance for the GPC perspective, how 
the data sharing works. We want to activate all of our GPC sites like that top one. We are hoping that UCLA, they are already working with uh, on Snowflake thing. That means they can share using Snowshare directly uh, in the environment. But if, if a site do, do not have Snowflake, they're gonna push their Piconer CDM in the S3 bucket, but then they're done, right? Be, from that, our automated script is gonna take it, push it in the Snowflake, um, do all the processing uh, for creating this harmonized Piconet common data model, but also harmonized I2B2, to to, that means researcher have data. Now that it is being created as a views, if the source data is being updated and further pi uh, pipeline is being automated, it makes it much easier to, to make the data made uh, a refresh data available behind I2B2. It just uh, works in a more streamlined way. I2B2 on Snowflake. Um, Snowflake is a fully managed um, database column store application. Um, it has SAML authentication. The storage optimization is out there. It can host a structured data on a structured data. Um, and it has elastic multi-cluster compute, which is called data warehouse in the world of Snowflake. Um, but compute and storage is being separated. So just so that you know, and we take advantage of the secure share over secure views uh, for, this, uh, for this architecture. Um, so how does Snowshare works? Uh, when the Snowshare is done, data is being visible based on the secure views that is being created. There's a difference between regular views versus the secure views. Secure views um, encapsulates the, the, the logic behind um, the, the algorithm to, to make the transformation. Let's say you have fully identified data and you wanna create a de-identified views. You don't have to replicate the data into de-identified. Um, but you could create the secure views to encapsulate the de-identification logic and then do the secure share so that you don't have to replicate data into multiple format to do that. So that's one of the advantage that, that we, we felt was uh, worked, worked great for us. Um, so the I2B to core server Snowflake implementation and the data installer is in the Missouri uh, BMI GitHub, but also in the I2B2 uh, repository as well that, um, that we, we did the uh, pull request. Um, maybe one time it will be merged uh, with the main branch, uh, but I think the I2B2 team has to uh, do further validation. And there was some validation done in uh, in collaboration with Jeff, Mike Mendes, uh, Sean, and other people. But I think uh, if it can be deployed here, then it might happen. Um, that means merging with the main branch. But right now, it is um, it exists a, as a as a branch in the I2B2 repository. So how does it work? People query I2B2, right? And then you have this harmonization part, Be, before that, another view, another layer of views, which is combining the snowshares as a view because the snowshare does not send the data to us at all, only give visibility over the views. And then each site um, does the snowflake secure share over secure views. So there's the secure view and that's the data. So one of the model could be people have their own instance of Snowflake, push the data and then do the secure view and the secure share. The compute node resides within, within the I2B2 environment. So the site's only sharing the data of the storage, but there is no further compute uh, there. And that works a little better because query response in a federated equation is if the site's compute node is powerful enough, it runs faster. If not, it may respond to you slower. But if you can control the compute in an environment that that the query execution and the data is being uh, kept separate, um, that problem uh, is resolved. The storage optimization is interesting. So if you see that one table 248 gigabyte came down to 21 gigabyte. That was like all of the GPC sites data in Snowflake, you know, um, it becomes 320 terabyte once we load it in Snowflake. I don't know the technology detail is part of the, the Snowflake's technology, but that's what I would be paying for. 
uh, 320 gigabyte after after storage. Um, and the charge is, I think, per gigabyte. Uh, we have the terabyte rate, but we get discounts too um, because we subscribe to a package. Um, but this compression was helpful to, to show that, um, that actual storage cost is much, much lower than what you would anticipate for based on your data size uh, in disk versus in Snowflake. But believe me, 25 billion encounters is not gonna be 320 gigabyte. Uh, I, show, I just showed you one file from one side is 348 gigabyte that we receive. So um, those are not optimized uh, storage format. And um, that's, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, the compute, oh, we have only five minutes left. I think I'm I'm pretty pretty close. Um, we are using the large uh, data warehouse size, which is the compute node in this environment, and auto shutdown to be set up as a five minutes of inactivity. That means if nobody is running query, the data warehouse uh, uh, the compute node goes uh, into uh, it's just shut down. But once someone runs an I2B to query, the uh, compute node will kick in again. So. Our average time uh, per day is one and a half hour uh, for both GPU and the uh, GPC and the MU data lake. Uh, 271 users uh, total in this um, statistics, about closer to 3,500 total queries. Average query execution time 82 seconds. Median query execution time is 52 seconds. 99th percentile is still less than 10 minutes. The longest one ran for 47 minutes. That's coming out of the, the, the application that is statistic that I'm showing. We are using the large data warehouse side, but we realize that even if we use the smallest data warehouse, that's a one eighth of a saving for us, it is still, there's not a significant difference in terms of query execution. So it's our choice, but we ch chose to go with the, with the large one to even further improve the query performance. <clears throat> so it's a matter of tuning and selecting the data warehouse size for your uh, cost optimization and expectation. Uh, the queries run pretty faster. For example, the total num and different sites probably have different experience. In that example with the Enact ontology, it executes three over three million queries to generate three million counts. Total num is the hyphen number that you see in the I2B2. We ran it for 57 minutes. It just ran in less than an hour. When we had PostgreSQL, I don't wanna go with the number. Our engineer didn't want it to run it because it runs for multiple days. We did not put a very powerful PostgreSQL server because when we migrate to cloud, it actually cost us quite a bit because we have to give a heavy compute power behind the database, whereas the database is sitting idle most of the time nobody is using the application. It's a low throughput application. That's why I mentioned that to you, that we don't expect hundreds of users computing at a single moment. Um, it does help you in Snowflake to do the query history and profile exploration. That means that can help further optimization of queries to make it, give it more Snowflake flavor. That means queries can run more faster. So our engineers wanted to spend time on it, but I told them not to right now. Um, because we need to talk more with the I2B2 team to see what kind of optimization or changing of the writing of the SQL query might be acceptable. But then we did not go any further uh, than that. Uh, open source everything. Um, the URLs um, are on the slide. And Diane has the slide. I don't know if they're posting. Hopefully they do. The work is being supported by the PCORI grant for the PCORNET network, Greater Plains Collaborative. And also we are part of the Wash U CTSA that the informatics core is also not for the CTSA for our institutions participation that we lead. So um, we also help, we are also helping Wash U to stand up their shrine on top of our I2B2 deployment through the GPC engagement. And that's being currently in, in progress to bring the institution back, uh, back on the ENAC network. And University of Missouri just activated ENAC uh, last week in production. Thank you so much, everyone. That's our team. We might have time for one question if we had one. Oops. We'll take two.
<laughs> yeah. Ontology that you build is a multi-fact. It's a multi-fact and we do the enact um, ontology. So the development is started like long back ago, right? But the reason we did enact because our desire to join enact, that's why we did the enact ontology and the multi-fact. Sean, I'm almost there. All right, great talk. So where does PCOR net stand in terms of putting it across the different PCOR net, PCORI networks? I would say Right now, our participation is to demonstrate that um, proof of concept that sites should agree to participate in this model. Uh, so we, I don't want to talk on behalf of PCORNET or the coordinating center, even though we are part of officially uh, part of it. Um, as of now, what we did so far is uh, to show that the Snowflake way of sharing works. Um, one synthetic data was put there. So, you know, in one of my screenshots, you saw that um, there's the Picorner CDM thing. So we have the data like Picorner CDM. So um, so we, we did show that it works. Uh, and then the next phase is coming to d uh, demonstrate using real data coming from other Picorner site beyond GPC. And we are, uh, the process is in progress right now. It's going a little slower, but that's where we are right now. And then it would be up to the steering committee to think about if this is the way to go in the long run, but I think it's just coming slowly uh, to show that uh, it is feasible. Did I see UCLA somewhere in the mix? Is that what I... So you see, so here uh, in this diagram that I show that the top one is Missouri, the second one is um, UCLA. Now UCLA um, on was on board to GPC as a um, expansion call, and it was done during the time we talked. Um, but then we got funding for one side that um, that. Um, Picornet uh, agreed, not Picornet, Picori um, funded to bring UCLA on board and they are doing the Snowflake way of data sharing uh, for our uh, grouse participation, which is one of the central enclave of the GPC to bring the site CDM data Plus CMS data, so that's the that's the project. But in terms of self-service query activation, or the functions existed in the network, but people had to submit a request. Someone has to write the code and run it, dispatch to every site, and then the result will be brought back. Um, so, so the function existed. We just we we wanted to uh, show that with activation of technology, the function can be simplified and more streamlined. That's all we did in this process. It, UCLA didn't share their data. Not yet. They, are, they just started at the beginning of this year, a uh, few months back, I think four or five months. Uh, so they are, they are still, they just passed their first EDC, the data characterization. And I think they're working with their institution to make the, the, the Snowflake thing available. Well, what we are hoping that um, once this is done, it will be, it will be demonstrated that way from for you. See. So thank you very much.